Matthew chapter 22, verse 23. As we continue through Matthew 22, um, we're still in the middle of a set of these conflict conversations between Jesus and his growing list of enemies and groups of enemies inside of the Jewish religious world of the day. Now remember that we are probably right in the middle of the Passion Week. So Jesus has entered the city of Jerusalem in this region for the final time before he heads to the cross and then to the tomb and to the resurrection. And so Jesus spends this entire week going back and forth in and out of Jerusalem in the temple courts. And when Jesus is in the temple, he is there teaching the people and doing all kinds of miracles and healing people. And that raises all of these conversations between him and his enemies. And so we continue in some of these conflict conversations Today, they continue to come at him with questions and issues that they believe to be unanswerable and complicated questions. They really are trying to trap Jesus, disconnect him from the crowds, find a reason to get him crucified and sent to Pilate. And so this morning, we're going to read specifically about two groups who take their turns at Jesus from two very different theological points of view. So their questions are very different, and one of them is actually very curious to you and to me. The Sadducees and the Pharisees come after Jesus one more time in this conversation. But as a matter of fact, these questions fail so completely that the next time we hear about Jesus' enemies, they're concocting their own courtroom scene They're gathering together false witnesses. They're going to do everything they can to get Jesus crucified. But in the meantime, in response to them and in response to their questions, Jesus continues to produce this incredible and amazing information about himself, who he is, and what life with him is really like. So we still get to listen to Jesus and what life with him is like even through these conflict conversations. We're going to see in our passage of Scripture this morning that Scripture makes some very clear but actually quite incredible claims about eternal life. This is one of those thoughts that's going to present itself to us clearly this morning. It's one of those things that every now and then I think should overwhelm us just a little bit. Every human being who has ever been conceived is still alive. Scripture makes some incredible claims about eternal life and that relationship with God. And so we see as a result of one of the conversations that God is God of the living, not of the dead. This is unique truth about God. This is, in fact, as Jesus puts it, a unique power that God has to create this kind of existence where he is God of the living and not of the dead. As a result of another one of our conversations, Christ is going to reiterate to us that love is at the center of our lives with God. That's going to have some incredible consequences. Even as this physical life comes to a close, if Jesus tarries, this physical body is going to wear out and it's going to die. But there are these threads that in Christ take us from this life beyond physical death into eternal life with God. And one of those threads is this relationship of love that every one of us develops with Jesus Christ. It's at the very center of of our lives with God. And then we'll see as the chapter wraps up that Jesus, in front of the Pharisees and Sadducees, in front of the crowds, he makes a claim to be king. And not just any king, but king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus Christ makes a public claim to be God. And it leaves his enemies silent. In fact, it's interesting what happens at the end of these conversations. We now get a couple of chapters of just Jesus now talking to his disciples, and you and me, as a result of what happens in this chapter. So let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 23. The same day Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. They they make a hypothetical case here. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and third, down to the seventh. All of them, excuse me, after all of them, the woman died. 
In the resurrection, therefore, <coughs> of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. They were all husband and wife. And so this is a curious question to you and me. This is not necessarily the kind of thing that keeps us up at night, but it's apparently the kind of thing that the Sadducees are interested in an answer to from Jesus. Matthew keeps throwing in these phrases that sort of remind us of what these days are like for Jesus, and it gives us a little bit of chronology. Matthew says, on the same day, the Sadducees approach Jesus with this question and issue. This is becoming a long day for Jesus, all of these conversations, his lists of enemies. And uh, remember, this list continues to grow. It's, it's as if on this day, they all gathered together, they took numbers, and they formed a line. <laughs> So first comes the chief priests and the elders of the people, and then come the disciples of the Pharisees and the Herodians, and now we've got the Sadducees, and, and on it goes. This is the kind of day that Jesus is having. But now the Sadducees come to Christ with this question, and Matthew reminds us about the Sadducees. On the same day, the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. Sadducees are an interesting group of people inside of the Jewish religious, religious structure. And in fact, it's a group that almost completely disappears from history after 70 A.D. We still have some of these other crowds after that moment, but the Sadducees just kind of disappear. But during, during Jesus' day and age, they were actually a very influential, we would call them a rather elite and wealthy group of people inside of their religious structure. Now, Matthew says they did not believe in the resurrection. So that, begins, that becomes interesting. The Sadducees are worshipers of the Old Testament God. They took the Old Testament scriptures literally and seriously, specifically the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They took that very seriously. But they had this curious belief that both soul and body for every human being dies at physical death, and we just cease to be. So they believe that there's just no resurrection, there's no eternal life with God. So they believed, they took a lot of Scripture seriously, but where Old Testament Scripture speaks of eternal life, they would contest the validity of that statement, or they would contest the interpretation of that passage. One particular passage of Scripture that's very important inside of this Old Testament debate comes from Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, where Daniel says, and, and many of those, many meaning all, will be raised to either life eternal or eternal condemnation. Every human soul is going to find itself in eternity, but the Sadducees would debate a passage of Scripture like that. But understanding them and their theology a little bit helps us understand the question and the point of the question that they ask Jesus. So they create this hypothetical scenario. This poor woman is married into a family, a very sickly seven brothers. And she marries the first, and they don't have a kid. She marries the second, they don't have a kid. She marries the third, and they don't have a kid. And on the story goes. And they say, well, Moses talks about this tradition. And sure enough, Moses talks about this in the book of Deuteronomy, and this practice goes even further back into the book of Genesis. And the Old Testament is often referred to as leveret marriage, and it has more to do with their economy and inheritance rights than anything else. The child, the oldest son, specifically of the oldest son, is going to inherit the land that's been given to that family. So if the oldest son dies without having children, <clears throat> then the next son steps in and on it goes. And it's particularly about inheritance. And most scholars believe that by Jesus' day, this is something that was rarely, if ever, even practiced. But nonetheless, it's inside of the Old Testament, and it's part of the Old Testament that the Sadducees accept and they believe it's a practice that they think proves their point that there is no such thing as the resurrection. So here's how you can boil down this interesting story about the woman and her seven husbands and brothers. Here's what they're saying. If there is a resurrection, Jesus, then this is absurd. Because this is absurd, there is therefore no resurrection. Does that make sense? It's actually a, a form of, it's a normal form of argumentation. If I take your idea and we walk down the logical trail a few steps and we get to a point of absurdity, then what I'm saying is your original idea is false because it's absurd. You know, whose wife is she going to be? She was wife to all of them. It's silly. The resurrection's not like that. Therefore, there's no such thing as the resurrection. So, 
Here's how Jesus answers them in verse 29. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, you have not read, or have you not read, what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So here's how Jesus answers them, and he essentially answers them with two points back at this hypothetical case that they've presented to him. And the first is this, you don't know the scriptures. You've mishandled scripture. You've misunderstood scripture. And in fact, we should be able to say that the Sadducees have done what we call cherry picking. So they have a theology, and so they've picked a piece of scripture that they believe supports that theology. And because there are other passages of God-ordained scripture that don't support their theology, they decide that's not God-breathed scripture. Does that make sense? So they've cherry-picked Scripture, making them false, making their view about the resurrection itself false. So you guys don't even know the Scriptures. The point that Jesus makes is that Scripture clearly teaches a resurrection of the eternal human person, the eternal soul, we say. And so their denial of that resurrection is contrary to Scriptural teaching. It's very easy to fall into this trap. And I have a theological point of view that I want to hang on to no matter what Scripture says, so I'm going to deny certain things that Scripture says so I can hold on to my point of view. It's easy to do this, and it's often how churches go wrong. So the Sadducees didn't know the Scriptures. And then Jesus says this, and you don't even know the power of God. You know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Of God. That's an interesting answer inside of this context. They don't understand that God has the power to create everlasting souls, to create a universe in which every human soul that comes into existence never goes out of existence. That should be a sobering thought, as a matter of fact, where we kind of let that one sink in. God has the power to create human souls that are like that, human lives that are like that. And he has the power to judge those human souls as well. And, Christ says, the resurrection is not like what you think it is. Okay? He says we don't marry and unmarry like we do kind of inside of this life, but we're like angels in heaven. Existence in the resurrection is just different than it is here. And God has the power to do that in our eternal relationship with him. You see, one of the mistakes the Sadducees made, and again, is easy for us to make, is that they assumed that eternity would pretty much be like life is now, just very, very long, and maybe we can fly, right? <laughs> it's just like this, just forever. Jesus says, you don't understand the Scriptures or the power of God is like, and how different that existence is going to be from this existence. And so the Sadducees make another mistake in their argument with Jesus. And I bring this up because I think these mistakes <clears throat> are all around us, and they're often used to deny the truth of the biblical faith. It's what we might call an objection from ignorance. And here's how this objection goes. If I don't understand it, it must not be true. That's a pretty common frustration with the Christian faith because there's a lot about God. And I might understand a little bit of, but I don't understand a lot of. There might even be some things about God that I don't quite yet understand. God's just like that. And so it's easy for people to say, well, because I don't understand it. Be making me the arbiter of everything that is true and false. And if I'm the standard, if my understanding becomes the standard of what is true and false in this universe, we are all in trouble. <laughs> So this is another silly objection that they make because they don't understand how it works. It must not work at all. So Jesus, again, with the Sadducees, what he does is he quotes Scripture from those first five books of the Old Testament. So a passage of Scripture that they admittedly take as being the Word of God. So he comes from the book of Exodus, and he says, Haven't you read the Scripture where God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? By the time that is spoken in the book of Exodus, 
All of those guys have physically passed away, but Jesus is making a point on that verb tense that those guys are still with God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> and in fact, it's interesting as Luke tells this story. In Luke chapter 20, verse 38, here in this passage, uh, Jesus says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Luke adds the phrase, for all live to him. All humans are alive to God. Haven't you read what Scripture says about the everlasting souls of human beings? So Jesus makes this point about God and who he is and what he is like. Our God, the one and only God who exists, is the eternal God of everlasting souls. This is part of the character, the nature, the power of God and who he is, the eternal God of everlasting souls. Every human exists forever, either in or out of the presence of God. And eternity is so much more than you and I can possibly imagine now. Don't you know that God has power to do things beyond what we can possibly imagine? God is the God, the eternal God of everlasting souls. Well, these conversations continue because the Pharisees, they, they're next in line. And they see that what happened to the Sadducees didn't go well for the Sadducees. So they shuffle off and the Pharisees step up. Verse, 20, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, I like this. You know you're in trouble when a lawyer asks you a question instead of the Pharisees, right? Maybe he actually handed him a notarized piece of paper. Who knows? And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So the Pharisees now ask their question. The crowd is still enamored with Jesus. They have not separated the crowd from Jesus. They haven't trapped him inside of their words, inside of his words. And Jesus continues to silence his enemies. <coughs> so they ask him a question that's actually really important to the teachers of the law in the day. Which is the greatest commandment? Which, which one's the most important? Now, to teachers of the law, <coughs> that's a big deal in Jesus' day. The law, the Torah, those first five books of the Old Testament, many people have counted the number of commands, distinct commands that are there, and the number that comes up over and over again is 613. And if you can imagine being a teacher of the Old Testament law, <coughs> excuse me, how much time you're going to spend parsing those laws, comparing those laws, figuring out how they act with each other, even ranking those laws. So this is a lot of what these teachers of the law spend their time doing. So when the lawyer asks Jesus this question, it's a question that comes <coughs> preloaded with a lot of debate, with a lot of argument, with a lot of difference of opinion. So when Jesus answers the question, he cites two Old Testament passages. And many scholars believe that this is actually the answer that a lot of these teachers would give to this same question. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses 4 through 7. <coughs> Excuse me, I was so excited this morning, I just keep coughing. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Jesus comes out of the middle of this. This passage is critically important to the people of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, or the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. This is a critical daily declaration for the people of God. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. 
and I owe him something. So it's a declaration of who he is. It distinguishes the God of the Bible from the gods and groups of gods and goddesses that everyone else around them worshipped. So they repeat this daily to remind themselves, to distinguish themselves about who God is and who they belong to, and then what this God is owed by me. So I should love this God with all my heart and with all my soul, with all of my might, with all of my mind. This language shows up over and over in these kinds of passages. So it's a daily declaration declaration of who he is and what I owe him. And then Jesus says, and the other one is very much like it. And he quotes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And the second half of that verse just simply says, and you will love your neighbor as you love yourselves. So it's not just that the people of God have this duty of love to God. The people of God have this duty of love to their neighbor as well. Because we belong to him and he's like this. Here's now what we owe him. Here's now what we owe each other as well. So an incredibly important passage for the people of God. So I want to think about this for a couple of minutes. If Jesus says this is at the top of the commandments, and then if all of the Old Testament hangs on these two commandments, then it's important that you and I spend some time with this, and we wrestle with this, and we try to figure some of this out. We love God, as Jesus says, with our heart, soul, and mind. Another passage in the New Testament is in the Gospel of Mark. We get heart, soul, mind, and strength. We get all of this kind of language wrapped up in how we are supposed to love the Lord our God. This list of concepts, heart, soul, mind, and strength, as we track those concepts out through the Old Testament and through the New Testament, we discover that they're actually quite overlapping. These concepts, they, they sort of, uh, they, their edges blur into each other and oftentimes will describe very similar things. So when we get a list like this, heart, soul, mind, and strength, this isn't necessarily a, a list of distinct points that this piece of you loves God, this piece of you loves God, this piece of you loves God. It's a way of saying everything that we can use to describe who you are owes God love everything about us. So while these concepts overlapped and eventually speak about everything that we are and everything that we do, these concepts nevertheless give us good reason to think through what they all mean and how we might be able to actually play this out. So it's, it's, it's useful from time to time to think through what all of this means, what's being said. We're supposed to love God with all of our hearts. The biblical concept of heart is far more than what you and I are used to when we talk about our hearts, our feelings, our emotions, the good emotions, the bad emotions. We tend to connect that to our concept of heart. The biblical concept of heart is bigger than that. Our hearts are like the rudders of our ships. They steer us. They move us. They're at the very core of who we are and what we do. Dallas Willard opens up his magnificent book, Renovation of the Heart, with this one sentence. We live from our heart. That's where our lives come from. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Pay all vigilance to your heart. Pay attention to your heart, for out of it flow the streams of life. If we're to pay attention to this thing that we call a heart, how important is it then, if our lives come out of this, how important is it then that the love of God is at the center of my heart, of our hearts? And like we said, it isn't just emotion. It contains our emotions, but it isn't just that. It becomes the core of our characters. It becomes the thing inside of us that desires things. It's the thing inside of us that helps us make decisions about Lives. So we see how much broader the biblical notion of heart is. So if we're looking at that, it's the core of my character and who I become. It helps me make decisions. It is a reflection. It, or let's put it like this. It contains my desires, the things I want most in life. And it's important for us, I think, to ask questions like this. 
If I'm going to catalog the desires, the deepest desires of my life, where inside of that catalog does the love of God actually fit? Where does the love of God fit into a description of my reason for living? Where does the love of God fit if I describe my reason for living, my purpose, my meaning, my life's overall direction? Where does the love of God fit there? And you might think, well, Pastor Phil, that's pretty big vocabulary. You're asking me to talk about my deepest desires, my reason for getting up in the morning, my reason to be alive tomorrow afternoon, and you're asking me to put the love of God there. Well, here's why that's important. Because if God is not there, something else will be. Someone else will be the answer to those questions. What's my reason for being? If it's not God, if it's not the love of God, it's going to be something else. And everything else fails in that position in my life. Only God puts this life together when He is in the right place in my life. So we love God with all of our hearts, and it becomes the rudder of the ship of our life. Love God with our hearts. We love God with all of our souls. This word for soul throughout the Old and New Testament really is very interesting. It's also a word that is used to describe us as a whole, as an integrated person. It's not just this kind of sense that we have this ghostly thing inside of us that someday when the physical body dies, it, it flies up into the air. Soul in Scripture even refers to my physical being as well. We are these whole integrated beings, and so we love God with all of our souls. And over time, it becomes a word that we use to talk about human beings as eternal kinds of things. So if this is my soul, what my soul is like, and Jesus says, and the Old Testament says, love God with all your soul, and you and I are these eternal, integrated, complete beings in the presence of God, is my soul headed in that direction with God? We love God with all of our hearts and with all of our souls and with all of our minds. <clears throat> I love the fact that this shows up in these lists in the New Testament. Our minds are quite simply that part of us that reasons and helps us make sense of the world and order the world. Some of you think you weren't given a mind. All of us were given minds. I don't care what anyone says about you. <laughs> Everyone has been given a mind. God has given you this capacity to reason through life. He's given you a distinct set of capacities inside of the mind and reasoning capacity He's given you. And whatever that looks like, all of it belongs to God. Love God with all your minds. Friends, I believe that Christians need to think well out of love for God. We shouldn't walk through this world as lemmings or as fools or as idiots. We think well for God. <clears throat> In fact, it's common inside of some Christian theological and philosophical circles to talk about outthinking the world for God. Christ is more than enough. Jesus Christ is more than enough to satisfy the most brilliant of all human minds. He is so much more than even all of that. And it is, in the end, another faculty that God has given me that I owe Him in love. So we love God with all of our minds. And we love God with all of our strength, our physical bodies, the capacities, whatever kinds of capacities God has given us physically, that belongs to God in love as well. He's given it to me, and I give it back to Him physically. Isn't that interesting? A passage of Scripture that speaks directly to our disciple, to, to what we call our spiritual formation, comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And listen to the kind of language that the Apostle Paul uses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You worship God. I learn to worship God by presenting my physical body to Him in love. And this is an important thing for us every now and then to spend some time thinking about. Shows up in Scripture often. Paul talks about it often. Here it is in the words of Christ. 
How is it with my physical body that I can learn to love God? It might even be easier to think in the flip side of that coin, how is it with this physical body I do things that dishonor God? How is it in this body that I actually divide myself from God? I distance myself from the Word of God, the things of God, conversation with God, prayer with God. How is it with this body I may distance myself from the people of God? All kinds of things I can do physically to dishonor God. What about things that I can do physically that honor God? One thing that jumps out in Scripture that's about as clear as it could possibly be, the Apostle James says, you can do a lot to love or dishonor God with this thing that sits in your mouth behind your teeth, your tongue. How is it that physically this thing works to love God or dishonor God? And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. So we know how difficult this, in this part of the physical body, we can use it to love God, and on the story goes. So we love God with our hearts, our souls, our minds, and all of our strength, everything that's about us. And then Jesus says, and there's a second one, and it's very much like it. We love our neighbors as ourselves. This is important for all kinds of reasons. Jesus says it's important for us to love our neighbors as ourselves, I think in large part because one of the most persistent temptations every human being faces is selfishness, okay? It's not just everybody else, it's you too. (laughs) One of the most persistent temptations of the human heart is selfishness. In other words, the temptation to love myself more than I love everybody else. So in comes the Word of Christ. In comes the Word of God into the lives of his people who read this and want to follow Christ and want to obey him and want to become like him. And we get this thing dropped into this heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't love yourself more than everybody else, but we're going to change that. We're going to turn it around. This is actually a really powerful moment inside of the life of the believer, the mouth of Christ from the words of Scripture. Because of these temptations and because of this matter of what it means to love our neighbors. And and when we learn how to do it, what a powerful change it is inside of the human heart. It's actually quite easy to love neighbors I never see. We can love our brothers and sisters in Madagascar by sending missionaries there, by paying for projects over there, by building hospitals, maybe even sending a short-term missions trip. And one of the glories of the short-term missions trip is that you don't get to know them long enough to dislike them, right? We love them from afar. There are some people in my life, just to be completely honest with you, I love more because they moved across country, right? It's just the way it goes. Because the closer that neighbor gets into my daily life, the more difficult it becomes to love that person as myself, to see them, as Paul says, as more important than myself. So when I begin to learn to love those people who are closest to me, who I know the best, and I know every reason not to love them, when Christ is at work inside of me and I learn to love them, some powerful things happen inside of the human heart. If we learn to take what is best about self-care and self-concern and all of that is, and to turn that into love for others, we're headed in the right direction. We're taking our cue from Christ. We're learning what it is to love others the way Christ loved them. Listen to something the disciple John says about this in 1 John chapter 4. If you want to read an entire book on the love of God, just Spend some time this afternoon with 1 John. In 1 John chapter 4, a couple of these verses, verses 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. In this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love God. His brother. These loves go hand in hand as far as John is concerned. 
If I'm loving God, then I'm learning how to love my brothers and sisters as well. I'm learning how to love my neighbor. We may even be able to say that when we learn this and when we express this kind of love for each other, it's one of those ways in which we use everything that we have to express our love to God as well. <clears throat> so these love goes, loves go hand in hand. And then Jesus says this, and this, this helps us understand how important this is, even if we're still figuring out how it works. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. <coughs> the Old Testament, Jesus says, hangs on these ideas. The Old Testament is filled with laws and commands. So, Jesus, which of these is the most important of all of the laws, important of all of the commands? So here's what Jesus says about this. My relationship to God and to his laws, his commands to me, my relationship to God and his laws is intended to be one of self-motivated love and not one of drudgery or coercion. My relationship to the commands that God gives me, they're not suggestions, they're commands that God gives me, should be one of self-motivated love instead of drudgery or coercion. Here's one of the incredible things about love when it actually becomes a part of how we think and behave and work with each other. Love becomes its own motivation. Love moves us to do things. We've talked about love in some other terms before. <clears throat> we know what we love by what we sacrifice for because we're motivated to give up for this. We, we're motivated to do all kinds of things in order for this to happen for this person or for this outcome to happen. So love actually becomes its own kind of motivation in our lives. So because of love, we're able to say things like this. Out of my love for God, I want to be in relationship with Him. I want to. I want to be close to Him. I want worship to be powerful. I want my time in His Word to reveal His will to me. I want to be in His presence. I want to know the power of His Holy Spirit. Love motivates us. Notice how it changes my desire. I express my desires with this word want. I want to be in relationship with God. I'm motivated to obey all that He has given me to do. And to do it with all that I have and all that I am. Think of it like this. Think of it in terms of a relationship that's at the point of breaking. Maybe even a marriage relationship that's at the point of breaking. If those two people come together and they spend time with a pastor or a counselor, one of the things that counselor or that pastor is going to do is they're going to start to coerce certain behaviors. And here's how, here's a little bit how that will often work. Well, trust has been broken in this relationship, so here's what we need to do. You are going to have to start behaving like this, and we're going to put boundaries on your behavior, and we're going to make you accountable for your behavior, and you, you're going to have to be patient, and you're going to have to be flexible. We're going to rebuild integrity and trust. We're going to coerce a certain set of behaviors. We might even be heavy-handed for a while, but that's going to help put this relationship back together again. If there's no communication at all, we're going to sit down, and we're going to force communication on you. Until things start coming out and we start being clear with each other. We're coercing behavior. And on and on, those kinds of lists and examples can kind of go, right? But here's what love does. Love moves the source of that behavior from outside of me to inside of me. You see, part of the point of this is not just that we go through the rest of our lives with coerced behavior to make a relationship better. Love gets built inside of us and we now want that relationship to be better. And so instead of it being coerced, it becomes part of my desires. It becomes part of what I want to see happen. And so it bubbles up from inside of me. So ideally, this is what happens in our lives. The Christian church has said this for a long time. I was reminded of this listening to another uh, Christian speaker a couple of days ago. Um, but the Christian church has said this for a very long time. Our loves are our habits. Our loves are our habits. <clears throat> we build these habits and lies for good or for ill. 
We have habits in our lives that are conscious and that are unconscious. We have habits that do good things to us and habits that do bad things to us. We have habits we've paid attention to and we've built on purpose. And then we have this whole world of habits in our lives that we haven't paid any attention to but continue to form us. A lot of my habits are bad and they're unconscious. And so to build love for God, to build love for the people who are nearest to me, oftentimes what we have to do is we have to deliberately build good habits. So good habits of interaction and relationship that are conscious, we do it on purpose. It's part of how love works inside of the human heart. And so before we leave this thought of, of love and sort of wrap it up, I want to I want to talk about this for just a second, about how we can actually do this. I'm going to give you a word, and then I'm going to give you several ideas. So you might even want to write some of this down. I'm not saying that it's worth anything, but maybe it will be worth something. So in our relationship with Christ, you and I are going to need to engage in behaviors that build relationship and over time build love for God as well. After all, this is what I owe him, and this is what I owe the body of Christ because of who God is. The one word is this. The word is worship. Some of you may recall that the mission statement of this church is we are committed to being a living hope through worship, word, discipleship, and mission. As worship is a powerful thing. Worship is one of those spaces where the Holy Spirit actually begins to reshape my life. My perspective, my thoughts, my heart, my desires. Worship is one of those places where we open ourselves to the presence and the work of God. And it's not just the 15, 20 minutes we spend singing on Sunday mornings. <laughs> worship is a part of the warp and woof of my life, of all that I do. So there's our word, our concept of worship. Here are some thoughts about what we should do. Some of these may sound straightforward and simple, but they're radically important. Get to know God in His Word. Read Scripture. Read it. If you read it yesterday, read it today. <laughs> if you read it all last year, read it this year again. If you love the Word of God and you really want to have a bad afternoon, go home and look up biblical literacy rates in America today. We are a culture that is awash. And Bibles and Bible translations and apps and devotionals and aids and all of that is magnificent and we are more biblically illiterate than our culture has ever been. That's trouble. That's trouble, guys. Get to know God in His Word. Spend time with the Word of God. However it works best for you, spend time in the Word of God, getting to know Him in Scripture. And then pray. Dedicate yourself again to prayer. Pray, and I'm going to give you some thoughts about prayer just very quickly. <coughs> Pray in thanksgiving to God. Praying in thanksgiving to God is a reforming of my priorities in life. To begin with thanksgiving, no matter what else is happening, to begin in thanksgiving reshapes me in some powerful ways. Pray in confession. Confess specific sins. Confess your sinfulness before God. And it's a recognition of my total and absolute reliance on the finished work of Jesus Christ for me. We pray in confession of sin. We pray in adoration. We read in Scripture about the greatness of God, His character, His nature, and we turn it back to Him in prayers of adoration. God, this is who you are. God, this is all that you have done. So many of the Psalms are filled with prayers of adoration and then, friends, our prayers of petition. We go before God with all of our needs. And as Paul says, even in thanksgiving, bring all of your needs before God in prayer. We lay all these things at the feet of God. And then, friends, as we've seen just even just a little bit this morning, set some new physical habit to help all of this actually work. A new habit in the morning, a new habit in the evening before you go to bed, a new habit when you get in the car to go to school or to work. Set some new physical habit where now you spend that time paying attention to God, reading His Word, listening to His Word. Set a new physical habit so that this can actually become a part of what we do in our regular lives. And friends, this is just some of the work of what it means for me to learn to love God with everything that I have 
and to learn what it means to love you the way Christ wants me to love you as well. Well, I think there is a bow tied on the end of this conversation with the last few verses of Matthew 22. So let's read this beginning in verse 41. I'm going to take a sip so I don't hack up a lung. You can thank me later. Verse 41. Now, when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. It's a great moment. While the Pharisees were standing there slack-jawed, right, Jesus asked them a question. And if you have a red-letter Bible, the, almost the rest of the next two or three chapters are just red letters. This is just Jesus lets loose. <laughs> it's great. They're on their heels, and so Jesus poses them a question. Whose son is the promised Messiah? Whose son will he be? And for them, it's an obvious answer. And in fact, in, the, in its way, it's the right answer. Well, he's the son of David. In fact, this is what the angel told Mary when the angel announced the birth of, or the conception and the birth of Jesus Christ, that what was in her, the child in her, would take the throne of his father David and sit on it forever and ever. So their answer is, in its way, correct, that the Messiah is <coughs> the great Old Testament king, the son of David. And what this means to them is that when the Christ comes, when the Messiah comes, he will be an even greater version of David, right? An even better earthly king. Their expectations are still political. He's going to be like David, but even more like David, right? And then Jesus says, well, now wait a second. In the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David spoke these words. <coughs> it's Psalm 110. And David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Christ isn't just, the coming Christ is not just the biological son or heir to the throne of David. David himself says the Messiah will be Lord. David knew under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Christ would be God a different king altogether. You see, this last little moment here is about Jesus. He's talking about him. And he silences them in large part because they know what Jesus has just claimed about himself. He is a descendant of David, but he is not a king like David. He is God himself. He is king of kings. I love this. In the end, one way or another, Jesus is the answer to every question that has been asked. The answer is you need to get to know Jesus and who he is. You need to get to know Jesus and who he truly is. The Christ, Jesus, will not be a mortal earthly king. He will be the eternal God who rules over everlasting Souls, this Jesus standing before them on this afternoon. When John the Revelator, it, this, this brought me into mind of some of what happens in the book of Revelation. When John the Revelator, right at the very beginning, he's brought into the, he's in the spirit, he's brought into the Lord's day, and he's standing before, he's standing before what turns out to be Christ. And he's, he's asking, he's wondering, who is this that he is with? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Christ answers this way, I am the Alpha and the Omega who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. See, this is what Jesus is laying the ground for. He is the eternal God who rules over everlasting souls. And then, friends, we learn that the Christ, Jesus, will be God himself. Do our love. Do our all. So we love him with everything that we have. And because of that, we're learning to love each other as well. Let's pray.